Another thing that I've noticed from doing this show is I have a greater appreciation of silent movies. You know, when you're a young man, sometimes silent movies can be a little boring. Even when older, they can be kind of boring, yes. Yeah. It's fascinating. It's like looking through a window to 100 years ago. I recently finally read Hitchcock Truffaut, the book-long interview that uh, Truffaut did with Alfred Hitchcock. Hitchcock, of course, started out in silent films, and he t talks about throughout his entire career how that influenced everything. All the greatest moments in Hitchcock movies are basically silent films with a soundtrack, and maybe some words, but you can follow everything by looking at it. The other thing that I constantly think when I'm watching silent movies is what? that they're all dead. All the people in this movie, anyone associated with the making of this movie, they're all dead. Even that little baby from, uh, from Jerry, Sunrise. Jerry Craycroft. <laughs> so we're just basically watching like ghosts perform a little haunted pageant on <laughs> your screen. So it makes it particularly creepy when you're watching something by... Uh, well, Cabin in a Caligari. Yeah, Cal Caligari. That's like, oh, that's like a horror story performed by ghosts. Or just like all the weirdness that's in like Trip to the Moon. Yeah. And everything else by that guy? Haxon. These are real devils from the underworld. <laughs> yes. I've got a bunch of movies that I've never seen before. You don't know what they are. Every episode, I'm going to spring one on you. It might be good. It might be bad. We'll watch it and talk about it. Welcome to The Basement. Women's History Month continues here on Welcome to the Basement, and we're going to watch another movie by another female director. It would be weird if we didn't. Tonight's director also didn't start her career in filmmaking. She started her career in another art form that is very near and dear to both of our hearts, improv. Oh! I'm talking about Elaine May. She only made a handful of movies, and one of them is one of the biggest flops in film history. That film is Ishtar. Oh, finally, I see Ishtar. I hear that this movie isn't as bad as it's made out to be. That's also what I've heard. Released in 1987, starring Warren Beatty and Dustin Hoffman, this film is estimated to have lost approximately $40 million at the American box office. We should look around box offices to see if some of the lost money's still there. That's not how it works. Oh. The reasons for the failure of this film are many. I can't get into all of them, but some of them were that Warren Beatty, the producer, got into a lot of arguments with Ms. May in the editing room. That's what Warren Beatty does. He gets into arguments. He loves arguments from what I understand. These and other post-production problems led to the film being delayed for over six months. So by the time it was released, it had built up so much negative buzz that it was doomed from the very start. So it destroyed Elaine May's career in the process, I believe? To this day, Elaine May has yet to direct another feature film. Critics were not kind. Roger Ebert had this to say. Ishtar is a truly dreadful film. A lifeless, massive, lumbering exercise in failed comedy. Failed comedy? Ooh. Elaine May had this to say of the film. If all the people who hate Ishtar had seen it, I would be a rich woman today. <laughs> At the Golden Raspberry Awards that year, Ms. May won for Worst Director, sharing the award with Norman Mailer the director of Tough Guys Don't Dance, who she tied with. I cannot imagine that this movie is going to be worse than Tough Guys. I also don't think it'll teach us how to eat potatoes. No. What we're watching tonight is actually the recently released director's cut of the film, which is two minutes shorter and apparently a lot better. I wanted to get the original theatrical release of this just so we could get the full flop experience, but it is not currently available in the U.S. What better way to honor Women's History Month by showing the cut that the woman who directed it intended us to see. But if this movie is as bad as everyone says, then the two of us might need a stiff drink to get through it. Or perhaps just this. <laughs> you remember those? Nickel nips. They're the wax bottles, candy things. Let's crack those open and have one. You're gonna have red, um, I'll have yellow. How do you do this? I believe you bite off the top, just like you do a normal Bre yeah. bottle. Mm. This yeah, is, that's gross. This is just sugar, corn syrup. Sugar we'll not too. finish that. Well, won't you hop on your camel and traverse the burning desert sands over to the oasis that is the old leather couch as we watch the legendary 80s bomb Ishtar. You really like those. No, I tolerate them. Just like you will Ishtar. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Tell 
Telling the truth is a bad idea. <laughs> telling the truth, telling the truth is a is a scary. Telling the truth is a scary predicament. I totally know the nature of truth now because because of this brainstorming session. <laughs> Lyle Rogers and Chuck Clark are songwriters. They've got heart, ambition, and big dreams. Telling the truth can be dangerous business. Honest and popular don't go hand in hand. They're trying to get this guy, Marty Freed, to be their agent. We got a, a new song we think is good enough for a record album. It's about truth and business. They invite Mr. Freed to a show that they're performing at that night. These two clowns aren't very good. I think these guys are both rain men. <laughs> but Marty offers them some overseas gigs anyway. You can either go down to Honduras, where there was a war going on at the time, or there's a gig I can get you in Morocco at a hotel. But they don't want to go overseas. They want to make it big in New York City. Lyle, do you mind? I kind of want to be alone to think. I'd like to just spill a bunch of things on the floor and then count them. They go to a bar to drown their sorrows. We have bourbon and water straight up. No problem. Stu's happy to serve. <laughs> they flash back to back before they met. Lyle drove an ice cream truck, and he couldn't help but write songs. Chuck was a piano player at a restaurant. Lyle hears Chuck play at the restaurant, and he's like, Hey, why don't we get together and write songs together? Half hour? We don't get overtime for this. You wait a try this. Oh. Half an hour, half an hour, like the last half hour. Any sentence you hear can become a song. As any sentence that you hear could become a song. See? See? <laughs> Um, are you talking to me? Are you the one you're talking to? It's okay if you're talking to me. I don't mind. I like to talk to people. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a talker. This Let's is face Dustin it, I, I'm a talker. Yes, this is my Dustin Hoffman. It gets better the longer I do it. Kind of. It kind of sounds like Stu as well. They started writing song after song after song, much to the chagrin of their ladies, who eventually leave them. If you never see me again, it'll only be one time less a week than you see me now. You can't leave. All the plants will die. Just trying to remember better movies. Ah. Uh. Lyle is inconsolable. Oh, he's got one of those big wax bottles. <laughs> Chuck is despondent. He's literally on the ledge. All they have left is each other. End of flashback and they decide, hey, let's take that gig in Morocco. Cut to Ishtar, just outside of Morocco, where some archeologists find a special map this map is the key to peace in the Middle East, or something. And the map foretells of two messengers from God arriving. Oh, I wonder who that will be. Meanwhile, Chuck and Lyle arrive in Ishtar. A beautiful young boy accosts Chuck and says, Hey, give, we gotta trade jacks and trade luggage. You gotta smuggle some stuff out of here. And he's like, Oh, I'm not into boys. And, he says, and she does this. Word. That, just like, check it out. Like, in a Muslim country, you should know. <laughs> this, this is really amazing. Look at what you have. I am a woman. The woman has balls and breasts. And she needs Chuck's passport. Or else her life is in danger. Chuck, being kind of an idiot, goes along with this. It's okay. You can just go to the American Embassy and get a new passport. You can be to your gig in, in Marrakesh tomorrow. It only takes a couple hours. No, it doesn't. Because there's political strife going on right now. And Chuck is not going to be able to get out of the city. He tells Lyle, go, go to Morocco, be a solo act. I'll get there as soon as I can. Please don't make me responsible for, for ruining our careers. I can't handle it. Do they have careers that are above ruination at this point? <laughs> Chuck stays in a hotel. How much is it? One hand that comes I would think in Ishtar all the cabbies would be American. <laughs> and he's approached by Jim Harrison, a fellow American, who invites him to dinner. Turns out Jim is with the CIA. And he needs an agent in the field. Can Chuck be that guy? Meanwhile in Morocco, Lyle takes the stage. So you just call out your favorite Simon and Garfunkel songs and... Uh, that one where old people talk to each other. Chuck gets there in time to save the show. They sing a few old standards and they're a hit. They perform very poorly, but they have a very understanding audience. That night, Lyle's asleep in his room. Someone breaks in. A man or a boy. I don't know. What is this man doing in my room? Lyle tackles him and just keeps on tackling him and grinding into him. He's like, you can't do this. Come on, I'm Warren Beatty. Most chicks dig this. <laughs> hey, wait a minute. What are these weird things on your chest? She is a woman. It's that same woman. 
Her name's She-Ra. And she's like, what? Stop it. She informs him she needs the contents of that suitcase. She's the one who took Chuck's passport. And there's all kinds of... She just give me the suitcase. It doesn't happen. She tells him to go to a camel market and ask for a blind camel. It's a code word for something. I didn't quite catch that. Sorry. Chuck meets once again with Jim Harrison. Oh, I guess I'll have the, um, well, whatever you eat here in Morocco, I suppose. I, I'm not very choosy. Um, you know, I'll, I'll have, uh, I'll have whatever he's having. You have better impersonations. You're so mean. I'm not mean. I just, someone has to tell you. Maybe if you would do a Charles Grodin. <laughs> See, now we're, you know, now we're cooperating. Jim, the spy master, is like, well, you should know, your buddy Lyle, he's hanging out with the woman who's working on the other side. So that makes him a communist. And Lyle's like, oh, no. Yeah, my Dustin Hoffman isn't good either. Chuck and Lyle are starting to become suspicious of each other, and they decide to go to that market. But they're being followed. There's a gunfight in the market! Lyle and Chuck get out of there. They get saved by this actual boy. They never question him. By this point, I'd be questioning every single boy doing the old... Double honk, just to find out. They stole the soundtrack from American Ninja 3. <laughs> Classic Casbah rooftop chase. Very Pepe Limoco. <laughs> Jim Harrison goes and meets with the Emir of Ishtar, Emir Youssef. And he tells Jim Harrison that he wants these two killed. He can't have the people thinking that these two are the messengers from God. Lyle goes to the camel merchant and asks for a blind camel. The merchant seems to know what he's talking about. Meanwhile, Chuck meets again with Shirasel. They have a heated discussion about something. I, I wasn't paying attention. It turns out the camel seller didn't know what he was talking about. He sold him literally a blind camel. He is to stupid to find the proper connection. Chuck! Hi. Camel's pretty funny, though. Come on, boy. Easy, boy. Easy, boy. Easy, boy. Look at him. He's great. These guys go in the desert. Chuck thinks that there's an oasis out there that they're going to arrive at, and the CIA is going to pick him up there. Lyle is told, here, take this, these magic beads. They glow in the dark. Just leave them behind you like bird's seed, and you'll be able to find your way back to town. And they get miserably lost. Turns out both sides were playing them. The CIA and the Arabs are both trying to kill them. They have an encounter with some vultures, proving that they're about to die. That's desert shorthand. You know that from New Yorker cartoons. Chuck, get up! I've never rooted for a buzzard before. <laughs> Except in that Bugs Bunny cartoon with the buzzard. No, 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 no. <laughs> These two guys are arguing. Things are... Tensions are high among Chuck and Lyle, the songwriting buddies. The windstorm blows up. Windstorm. Gosh darn it, a windstorm blew up. After they come out of the storm, they come upon an encampment of gun runners who seem to think that Chuck is some sort of auctioneer. He has to communicate with this group of foreign people and try and convince the gun runners that he's selling them guns and it's difficult, but he pulls it off. They escape that and they end up getting a couple of guns as well. Then again, they're lost in the desert. Water. They need water. What have I done with my life, Lyle? Things were going so good. I did Tootsie. I had Kramer versus Kramer. Everything seems so possible. Now look at us! Lyle discovers that the map is sewn into the lining of Chuck's jacket. He must have taken it out of that suitcase that he exchanged with Shirasel. Just then, helicopters appear on the horizon. Finally, they're coming to rescue us. No, they're coming to gun you down. It looks like this is the end for Chuck and Lyle, but who should show up but Shira Sell and her little buddy? They have guns too. They fire at the CIA helicopters and the CIA realize that their covert operation has been exposed and they better get the hell out of there or they're gonna get in trouble. Jim is like, who are you really working for? It's like, who's your agent? And he's like, well, it's Marty Freed. And so they contact Marty Freed. If you don't want this all over the worldwide papers, you're gonna do two things. You're going to institute political change in the Middle East, however that's supposed to happen, and you're going to promote Lyle and Chuck's album. And the CIA says, why not? I'm sure it's Del. Definitely. I'm Abdul. Which one of you is a woman? Only one way to find out. <laughs> <laughs> they sing a bunch of songs, one of them to the woman that they both love, you know who, Shira, the girl with the breasts. I think they're wonderful. Oh, 
She's an idiot. <laughs> Telling the truth is a dangerous business. I think it's time for us to tell the truth about Ishtar. We are not here to tell the truth that it is an underrated lost masterpiece. It's the cinematic equivalent of an hour and 45 minute swig from a nickel nip. Y yes. Oh, God. Where do we start that's with a, this? That's a good question. I think we start by looking at the duo that obviously influenced this film, and that's Hope and Crosby. Yes. Now, you look at those road movies, Road to Morocco, mm -hmm. Road to whatever. Now, those two were kind of buffoons as well. Yes. But there was more of a contrast. Crosby was more of the smart one. Mm -hmm. Bob Hope was more of the dummy. Yeah. These two are both idiots. Yes. So there is no contrast between them. Warren Beatty is supposed to be more of an idiot, but still, it doesn't fly at all. All. Yeah, it's a, it's a game of inches with those yeah. two. Well, there's no backstory with Hope and Crosby. You really don't care where the Three Stooges come from. But here they're like, we're going to give you their backstory. Flashbacks, unnecessary in this movie. Yeah, and yeah. And it should be, these are two losers, let's send them on a tour. And one thing that would have made this movie work a little more is if the two leads were a little younger. It's hard to believe that... Two 50-year-olds would be this dumb and this naive. You never care for them once. You look at Dumb and Dumber, mm -hmm. where these two are... I mean, the whole point is that they're broad. Like, these guys could never exist in our world. But there's still something that's endearing about them. Yeah. Even when they're being awful to each other. These two seem to be specifically in our world. They're just, you know... They're, and, they're, and they're just so phony mm -hmm. that you, you don't believe it for a minute. Warren Beatty's trying really hard not to be Warren Beatty in this movie. You know, the way he walked was unnaturally interesting. You know, he made a bad choice with uh, the occasional Texas accent. At that least, came and went. Yeah, at least he was, like, really trying. I can't stand Warren Beatty in general. I just think he's, like, the gold standard of Hollywood douchebags. But he did really shed that for mm -hmm. this role. Unfortunately, it was for this role. The douchebaggery evidently just filtered down probably to the rest of the production. <laughs> Obviously in the editing room, I'm sure he was out there screaming at Elaine May in the desert. His agreement with Arthur Penn when they were doing Bonnie and Clyde was that they would get into one argument every day. Oh, okay. Because if they're not arguing, they're not passionate about it. And arguments is where ideas come from, which is something I don't huh. agree with, but I can see where he's coming from. Yeah. Here, I'm sure that, you know, Elaine May was just kind of like probably argued off a cliff. Yeah, I can't imagine hanging out with the he guy. He is a hell of an actor. But, you know, he'd just be hitting on your wife all the time. Yeah. You stay away from Tona, Warren Beatty. Yeah. You're too old anyway. <laughs> Beyond the two leads, let's look at the artistry of the movie. Was there any? It looked as bad as any late night cable movie you would catch in the 80s that took place in some exotic desert locale. Yeah, very artlessly filmed you know what was really good about this movie? No. The animal actors. <laughs> and that was another sad thing about it, is that Dustin Hoffman and Warren Beatty were constantly being upstaged by animals. <laughs> <laughs> and there are occasions when the comedy hits, but it seems to be just an accident of timing. And a bunch of decent moments doesn't make for a decent movie. Yeah. I don't think I've ever seen a movie that just in its molecular structure does not work. <laughs> And also, I've never seen a movie that has cost so much to make where there's so little on the screen. Yeah. This movie actually, in its opening weekend, was number one at the box office. Was it? But it fell precipitously off when Beverly Hills Cop 2 was released. Wow. And that's not even a good movie. Yeah. Hey, well, she may not have directed another film, but she went on to write the screenplay for The Birdcage, which is a movie that I think is great. Oh, it's beautiful. And, and she was nominated for an Oscar for the screenplay for Primary Colors. Well, then. So, Elaine May is doing okay. Yes. And we hope you're doing okay as well. We just watched Ishtar. You should check it out, if just to see how not to make a movie. Are you thirsty? Thirsty for more content? Well, you should go to the oasis that is our website. Welcome to TheBasementShow.com. All the episodes that we've ever made are on that website. And there's a PayPal donation button where you can donate to support the show. You can donate one time, or you can set up a monthly rolling donation where you donate a certain amount every month. Do people it, actually do that? They do it, and it helps out our show. People like Patricia, Edward, Corey, Martha, Stephanie, Michael, Alexander, Jason, Stephanie, George, Joe, Sierra, Patrick, Brian, Lee, Steve, and Mike. Michael, thanks, monthly donors. Thank you very much. I recently went to our P.O. box, and yes. you know what? It was chocked full of stuff. Six postcards. Whoa, holy crap. And two packages. David James Keaton sent us his book, 
The Last Projector. I'm going to check that out. It's a hysterical fever dream of a novel. Thanks, David. And somebody sent me a record. Whoa! There was no note with it, but it's from vinyltap.co.uk. I like records. It is Peter Hamill. This is an album from 1977. I've never heard of this guy or heard this music. I'm looking forward to listening to this while I read my projector book. And while I look at postcards from Lake George in the Adirondacks of New York, a jackalope, which is a monster in the American prairies. It uh, looks like Barcelona. Thanks, guys. We appreciate your kindness. And now it's time for seeing it. And we really mean it. The theme for Cena tonight is For the Ladies. We pay tribute to more female directors. Nathan Gustafson says, Near Dark, one of my old favorites and underrated vampire movie. Seen it. <sighs> Seen it. It's a bloody masterpiece. It's a great vampire movie. Oh, that, it's great fun. Yeah. It's a hell of a midnight movie. My very first girlfriend, she loved this movie and she told me to see it but i'd waited like 20 years before i got around to it so Lori, i finally watched it acita de canola says an education such a beautiful movie i totally fell in love with carrie mulligan after it seen it seen it uh, the entire world fell in love with carrie mulligan after that she's a cutie that carrie mulligan well and a very good actress you know the one thing about an education i don't like the title it is the <laughs> dullest title you could ever come up with if it was called The Education or simply Education, those would be more interesting titles than An Education. <laughs> There's only one part of it I don't like, and there, it's a montage scene at the end of the movie where she's studying, and she's reading a book, and she's like, nah, and she throws it across the room. It's like, oh, studying. It's like... <laughs> Yeah, Peter Sarsgaard, I know he's a good actor, but I just, ah, there's something about him. The creepy eyes. Mm -hmm. I, oh, I, I, I love his eyes. Ew. It gives me the willies. <laughs> Allison Healy, still holding out hope for Marjane Satrapi's Persepolis. Seen it. Persepolis is a cartoon autobiography based on Miss Satrapi's adventures growing up in uh, late Shaw period Iran and the early Ayatollah period. Even though she can get out of Iran, that doesn't make her life any easier. The animation style on this is really cool. Did not win the best animated feature, I believe. No, there's always a Pixar movie to, to do that. Yeah. I like it when she sings Eye of the Tiger. Yeah. Jay Park writes, Big brings back so many childhood memories from the 80s. How I love this. Seen it. See, oh, I've he, seen he, it. See, he, 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 it. You know who's in that movie? Welcome to the Basement Hall of Famer, Robert Loja. That's right, playing the piano with his feet. He's that good. This is the sweetest role he's ever played. I know. It's a great movie. I think it's Tom Hanks' best performance. You believe that he's a child throughout that movie. One of many 1980s body swap movies, and certainly... By far and away the best one. Oh, yeah, yeah. Put, put, because most of them are crappy. Yeah, it's uh, other than Peggy Sue Got Married and Big, it, no one's going back to see 18 again. <laughs> no. That's seen it. And that's our show. Thanks for joining us for Ishtar. It was a long desert to go through, but we made it together. Come back again next time where we'll be watching another movie. We're going to be talking about it. You know how the show works, man. We'll see you then. Good night. Good night. Is that casual enough? Yeah. yeah. Mint tea. No, thank you. Kawa. No, thank you. Pepsi Cola. No. Please, I don't want anything to drink. I just want to talk to you about something. A There's a, I have a problem. Uh, it's, 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 uh, it's, it's, problem. It's, it's, it's a big problem. Huh? Sometimes my impersonations are more in the spirit of the character <laughs> rather than the sound of their voice.